Hello, I'm Michael North, and welcome to the Think Tech Studios in beautiful downtown Honolulu. We'd like to welcome you back to another episode of The Art of Thinking Smart. This series was originally created by David Chang of Wellsbridge, and I'm co-hosting the programs for him for some time. And the idea behind this series is to transmit some of the accumulated wisdom of some of the leaders of Hawaii about how they have achieved success. What are the roots of their success? What sustains them? And what are their ultimate goals? And the idea is thinking smart is much better than just thinking fast or thinking big. Um, being able to think around a corner instead of barreling through a wall is far better key to success in the long term for those of us who are dedicated to a life of service to our community and through business. And business is the, is the downstroke for our guest today, who is Rob Robinson. Rob has, uh, has followed a, a twisting path to this studio uh, today, beginning in South Africa and going through uh, Harvard and other universities and coming to Hawaii um, in the early part of this century. Uh, to work as a, as a professor at the University of Hawaii in the business school there. And he's one of the, he's really one of the founders of the venture capital industry in Hawaii. Um, coincident with Rob's arrival here, or maybe to some degree because of it, um, an active venture capital industry has sprung up uh, in Hawaii. Uh, Rob, what I want to ask you is, the values that drive you today, the standards that you have for what is worthwhile, what is meaningful, how you direct your priorities on a day-to-day -day basis, they started somewhere way back in South Africa. And when you were four years old, something happened <laughs> with you or your father or your mm -hmm. mother or a neighbor or something that you read or saw. Where did your, the development of your values begin and how? Share with us a little, a little story, a little experience of those roots. Oh well, thank you, Michael, and it, it, it's good to be here. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't normally get asked to go that far back in my my, my history. Um, uh, usually, people start with, uh, "How long have you been in Hawaii?" Um, yes. So, um, but it is true. I grew up in South Africa in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, it, not a great time to be. Um, in South Africa at the height of uh, apartheid and the world's um, rejection of um, that system of government. And um, I obviously, uh, um, I, I'm sure your audience can tell, uh, but I'm, I'm a white South African. Mm -hmm. um, there were many of my countrymen who were not white, who were discriminated against uh, and uh, treated very badly by the apartheid regime. And um, I, I can't really explain uh, why I developed a, a sense of uh, injustice about that, and many uh, other people did not seem particularly bothered by it. But for me, it seemed very inconsistent that um, uh, I would be treated one way in my life and other people would be treated another way based purely on the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. And um, I think out of that, I developed a, a sense of um, of conscience and of, of fairness and justice. Um, um, uh, I, I definitely, one of my hot button issues is injustice and um, mm -hmm. um, um, seeing uh, people being treated un unfairly. Mm -hmm. um, and I also developed, I think, what is a, a healthy skepticism about government and um, what government tells you. Uh, because I, I grew up in a very restricted media environment where there were no private sources of, of information, uh, at least not free sources of information. Mm -hmm. And so all we got were state-approved um, uh, propaganda. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to learn to think critically about what I was hearing and, and compare the reality of what I was seeing every day mm -hmm. with what I was being told. Um, and I, I think that sort of critical thinking is essential for an academic. I, I think you, mm -hmm. 
you're taught to do that. Is this something that you teach in your classes at <laughs> Well, perhaps. Does this in yeah. inform the ethics of your, of your, of your classes there? I, I think the, the, the notion of fairness and justice and, and treating people with respect and um, uh, not accepting um, you, that one automatically has an advantage just because one's locked into a particular situation. Mm -hmm. Um, is 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 a part of my teaching. Mm -hmm. I, I'm obviously I'm at a business school. I'm not in a political science department, and I, I don't teach civics. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think those those values remain with me. Um, so those values have a place in business discourse, and they form a style. I think, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of the most successful companies are those that practice diversity um, and promote the people based on merit rather than based on external features and cultural judgments and so on. And I find it interesting that you started in a place which was probably one of the least tolerant and diverse societies of the 20th century. And here you are now in Hawaii, which is probably the most tolerant and most diverse of all the 50 states in the United States. Hmm. You think there's some kind of center of gravity that drew you ever westward to this place? Uh, that's interesting. I, I, and, you know, and yet Hawaii is strangely familiar to me. You know, the first time I got off an airplane in Honolulu and I looked around, um, Hawaii is um, uh, almost exactly on the opposite side of the globe to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the, the East, West, and North, yes, South. Yes, right. Yeah. If, you, if you took and a knit, knitting needle these, and you put yeah. it through, through a globe of with Hawaii and through the center of the earth, it comes out very close to South Africa. Oh, okay. And so the climate is very similar. Um, I grew up in a place called Durban, which is on the east coast of South Africa, which is a warm water surfing paradise. Yeah. Um, I know and uh, a lot of the flora and fauna is the same. The flora and the fauna, we, we, we have the, the mongoose you have, we have here, unfortunately, all invasive species, mm -hmm. the, the bufu frog, the, the um, or toad, the, the uh, mongoose, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, the minor birds, um, uh, uh, giants, snails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Those were all in my backyard when I was a kid growing right. up in South Africa. Yeah. But in terms of the diversity, you know, Durban was a very diverse environment. Um, we had a lot of um, uh, people of Indian origin. Yeah. Uh, that's actually where Gandhi yes. um, got his start, which a lot of people don't know. Yeah. And, um, and so the diversity of Hawaii actually reminds me of that environment. Mm. It's, but it's a more benign right. <laughs> version right. of the place I grew up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So the values that you had in those days have translated into a series of practices, day-to-day -day habits that you have. And when you get up in the morning, mm -hmm. I'm sure you have, as we all do, you have a ritual that you go through mm -hmm. and you have a way of sort of envisioning your day and going forward to it. Can you share with us a little bit about the, the discipline that you use to organize your thinking and your day and your priorities to mm -hmm. set yourself um, something practical that people who are watching this can say eh, this is a pretty interesting successful guy he's got you know he's always he's always lost enough hair that he <laughs> that he knows something that's about what's going on so let's let's listen to his advice what what have you learned about how to be a successful human well uh, i um I'll let others judge of whether I'm a successful human, but I, I can talk a little bit about my, my routines. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I think I'm fairly boring. I, I, I like to, um, when I wake up in the morning, uh, the first thing I want to know is what's been going on in the world during the night. You know, Hawaii is, uh, we're at the, the end of um, the time zones, and so usually quite a lot has happened in business and politics, uh, socially, mm -hmm. so I want to, uh, um, look at the New York Times, I want to read uh, the local paper, um, catch up with what's going on, find out if anybody's trying to get a hold of me, um, <laughs> and um, just generally, you know, sort of um, orient myself towards the day. Um, and then I like to try and think through what do I have to do today, what do I want to accomplish. Um, I find it's very important to sort of, uh, even though my, my calendar and I, I think we have this tendency uh, these days to be driven by our, our smartphones and what our calendar says we should be doing. Mm -hmm. But try and think through, all right, what are my 
what are my priorities? What am I working on right now? What do I need to get done? Mm -hmm. uh, and when am I going to do those things? And I'll look at my calendar and say, right, well, I have this appointment at 10. I have this appointment at 1. You know, um, so I have an hour or two between you know, 11 and 1 to, to maybe work on this. Um, what am I going to do later in the day? And, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think, um, I, and I try and be more, um, as they say, in the now um, than, I, than I typically uh, succeed at, at being, mm -hmm. because I know that's important. Because it, it, is, it is easy just to um, uh, get into the flow of work, and you don't, you're not really being very mindful about what you're doing and how you're living your life. Mm -hmm. And so I like to try and take time out for myself along the way and just sort of check in with myself and, and, mm -hmm. and, and say, you know, uh, okay, how's, how's my day going? How am I feeling? If I'm annoyed or upset, why am I annoyed or upset? You know, what's, right. what's not working out? And, and try and take a corrective, you know, action uh, mm -hmm. before that uh, grows and amplifies itself. Right. And one of your roles is as the chairperson of the Hawaii Angels. Yes. And we have a, a shot of the website for the Angels. Ah. That's a group that's been around for probably 15 years. Now, right, and you're, it's part of your job to uh, to coordinate the monthly meetings and other special meetings that happen with specific projects right. throughout the month, and to bring potential investors and and companies in, and you audition companies, right. and so you're in a leadership position, and a part of leadership, would you agree, is transmitting those values that yes. we're talking about. Yeah. Very much so. Um, and uh, yeah, for those of your, your viewers who don't know, um, uh, so Angel organization is very much like the show Shark Tank, but, but nicer. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and we give people more time. And so uh, I think Shark Tank was modeled on the, on the Angels. Oh, yeah, very, very idea. much so. And, yeah. and the venture capitalist, you yeah. know. But it, but it sort of, I think, is obviously it's, it, it is um, a show that's produced um, for maximum production yeah. and audience value yeah. um, with less, I think, um, regard given to the actual entrepreneurs. And, and for me, um, being an angel investor and, and coordinating um, the angel network is uh, all about the entrepreneurs. Um, yeah. I get a lot out of working with young people with their passion and their excitement about what they're doing. Yeah. I like to mentor and, and, and coach them, mm. uh, help them find money. And I try and do it in a way that's always positive. And you've done that pretty successfully. You've helped to raise $100 million or more. In, in, in one shape or another, through the Angel Group or through our ongoing private equity um, uh, investments, yes. I, would, it, uh, you know, I don't have an exact number, but it, it is almost at this point certainly in excess of $100 million here in Hawaii. Yeah. So you have a, there's a private equity fund that you manage? Well, and the, that's Kolahala? Right. We have the, a shot of that website here right. too. Kalahala Holdings was an entity that I started with a partner back in um, 2006, mm -hmm. uh, really as an outgrowth of the Angel um, Network because what we found with the Angels is we'd seed them a little bit of money and they'd get going and then they would need a larger sum of money. Yeah. And uh, because we're not the Bay Area and we don't have a lot of um, venture capital mm -hmm. you know, readily accessible, there was a question and I felt something of a moral duty to try and help these companies that we had nurtured to, to get to the next level. Yeah. And so uh, we started Kalahala, which was a, an institutional investor, where we could aggregate uh, money from um, individual investors into a larger sum mm -hmm. and, then, and then make those investments as well. Right. Right. So I'm usually, like you, I'm usually a glass half full kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Let's just sort of invert that for a <laughs> moment and look at a glass half empty mm -hmm. sort of because you do meet a lot of companies who are eager for exposure and their kids in a garage or their companies that have been around for 20 years or there's somebody who's looking to make an impact here in the Hawaii market. They're, they come from a lot of different vectors. Right. What are the things that you see that drive you nuts when you <laughs> see a company that they're just doing things all upside down and yeah. wrong? What are, the, what are the danger signs that you see that that, uh, that you try to either ameliorate or that you use as a screen to just say, thank you very much, see you later. Yeah. Boy, let me, let me count the ways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, um, there are many different uh, things that disqualify a company. Um, uh, 
Let me let me just start at a at a uh, you know with with one and, and and maybe talk about a couple of the others. Um, uh, very commonly, we we see um, what I what I call the lone inventor, um, which is somebody that has an idea. Um, they have a product that they they believe is a world beater. It's mm -hmm. a better mousetrap, mm -hmm. and they, uh, per the the old saying, expect the world to beat a path to their door. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, that's not how the world works. Um, uh, I always tell my not students. Often. There's always a Steve Jobs and a Steve Wozniak in there. Yeah, they're, yeah. but I think they're if, the exception. Well, so I think if you look at those people, the point that I'm going to make is, you know, without without you know Steve Jobs' exquisite sense of the aesthetic, his mm -hmm. his understanding of of human factors, his ability to negotiate corporate boardrooms and so on, I don't think uh, you know Apple would would be what it is today. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you get somebody who thinks they have a product that is of enormous you know, value. And I always tell my students, um, you know, um, invention is, is, you know, it's the old saying, it, it's 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration, yeah. right? And so just because you, you have something that may have value doesn't automatically mean that it has value today. So the and fanatic gleam is not necessarily a a guarantor of success. There, there's this fine line between, with entrepreneurs, between sort of indefatigable optimism yeah. and insanity. You've got to uh, have that. Right. But just edging right up. Right. With that thought, let's take a break for a moment, for a station break, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host of Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. You're watching ThinkTech on ThinkTechHawaii.com, which broadcasts five live talk shows from noon to 5 p.m. every weekday, and then streams our earlier shows all night long. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. So we're back with Rob Robinson, and he's talking about things that drive him crazy about entrepreneurs. Number one was the fanatical gleam, with the idea you have to get right up to the edge of the fanatical gleam and then come back a notch or two mm -hmm. before you have a real successful um, formula. What's another factor that you... Well, I, and uh, one of the things the fanatical gleam leads to, um, I thought it's not always a result of that, is a um, mistaken sense of value. So, you know, what, what private investors do, what uh, venture capitalists do, is essentially what they do on Shark Tank, uh, right? Is they say, look, I'll give you X amount of money for Y percentage of your company. Mm. And um, generally speaking, if you're if you don't have a company yet, um, you you're looking at a valuation of what you have is maybe worth a million dollars, maybe worth two million dollars mm -hmm. on a generous mm -hmm. on a generous day, mm -hmm. less than that on many days. And um, the entrepreneur will be looking at the end state five years, ten years down the road when they are the head of a multi-billion dollar corporation and mm -hmm. saying, well, no, this is a ten billion dollar idea. Mm -hmm. There's no way I'm giving you, you know. 10% of my company for uh, $100,000, right? And um, that's a very difficult conversation and a very difficult process to go through. Um, a, a, another one would be the team, uh, who the team is. Um, do you have um, the requisite skills or are you a group of people who all have the same skills because you all met in the same program in college yeah. and you have a company and, and that's great, you've got marketing covered, but, but, or whatever it is, but now you need a financial person, you know, you need a, a, um, a, a CEO, you need an yeah, engineer, yeah, yeah. you know, right? Yeah. And so um, are you willing to admit people into your company uh, who, who are going to have a big chunk of that company in order to turn it into a real company, or are you really just interested in mm. pursuing your dream uh, with your friends, in which case it's probably never going to amount to that much. Right. Um, and there are, there are other ones as well. So as you say, I like to be positive. I, I find um, if an if a entrepreneur is willing to be coached, no matter how 
uh, misguided they may be initially, mm -hmm. um, we can usually work with them. Mm -hmm. It's the ones who don't want to be coached who just say, look, give me money, I know what I'm doing, mm -hmm. uh, that are more problematic. Yeah. yeah, the companies that I know that are becoming successful now also have, at the core of them, they have a sense of social responsibility, of sustainability built into the core of their company, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it makes the most business sense in the long run, and really because a lot of investors are starting to use that mm -hmm. as a criterion for evaluating and differentiating between companies. Mm -hmm. And is that, a, is that a new trend, or is that an old one? Is this old wine and new bottles? Do, do you agree with me that this is increasingly important? Um, I would, I would um, draw a, a, perhaps a slightly fine distinction here. Um, I think the whole notion of um, social impact investing or triple bottom line and you know whatever you want to call it these days <clears throat> is a rel <clears throat> excuse me is a relatively new term and, and it's one that has gone at great currency in in our current market um, but I think that if you go back and you look at companies um, and you I mean I mean just what popped into my head when you're talking is you go back and look at a company like Mary Kay right I mean Mary Kay it, cosmetics is not anybody's idea of a you know socially conscious company but if you look at the basis on which it was founded mm. it was in order to help um, housewives who didn't have an outlet for their their you know business instincts right. and to provide them with an income to make them more independent of their their spouses mm. um, and in order to empower them right mm. and today we would say that's great that's that's a you know socially conscious uh, female uh, owned uh, business and I think a, a lot of businesses, whether or not they are explicitly um, uh, social impact companies or, or, or not, have at their core values about making the world a better place, mm -hmm. making, um, making uh, people's problems um, uh, less severe. I mean, if you look at my, 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 um, uh, my landsman, as, as they say, uh, Elon Musk, Right, mm -hmm. um, a lot of what he does yeah. is about a vision of a better world. You know, um, uh, electric cars, yeah. um, space exploration, yeah. faster transportation. He doesn't go out and say, you know, I'm a I'm a social impact entrepreneur no. uh, explicitly. But I think those values are quite clear uh, in the things he chooses to do. He, yeah. he doesn't choose to. Um, you know, uh, process uh, baby seals for, no, uh, no. Uh, you know, coats or anything like and that. all of his right. ideas yeah. are multi-trillion dollar ideas right. if they work out. Right. But they are also ideas that will transform the way that we see right. and live and work. Right. And he's a, he's a futurist, so he, his, his values are about what the world can become. Yeah. Uh, other people are, are concerned with the world as it is and how we deal with that, but I think it's all coming from the same place. Right. right. And I think Hawaii is a particularly uh, Akamai host for those types yes. of ideas. Yeah. And it probably starts in our original native culture, which somehow infuses the rocks on which we walk. I'm sure you've noticed that. Absolutely. I, I mean, Hawaii is a very welcoming place, has great family values, has great, a great sense of, of, of communal, communalism, if you will. Um, you know, when we started Angels, we actually had to draw a line and say, however noble the pursuit, the company still has to stand on its own two feet. You know, we would get we we were approached by a lot of companies which were essentially charities or you know um, uh, companies that that didn't have a business model. And yeah. we said, you know, Hawaii has a lot of that, um, and and obviously could use more. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to grow a business sector here that can grow jobs and can provide meaningful employment for our graduates, uh, high school students, my children, <laughs> your children, you know. We also want to um, nurture a set of skills that will allow these people to compete in, in the larger global economy as well. Mm -hmm. So we, while we, we very much embrace the, you know, the, the notion of family and the notion of social responsibility, we also uh, balance that with uh, the ability to actually sustain yourself economically. Right. Yeah. I think when I first met you about a dozen years ago or mm. so, we would commonly lament on the relatively sparse um, 
uh, resources available for venture capital yes. on these little rocks in the middle of the Pacific. And right. then there was sometimes an insular sort of set of attitudes that kept us isolated. But I think that started to change. Mm -hmm. And we've started to open our screens to, yeah. to, uh, to tides that flow in from a lot of different directions typified by the blue startups and by the various accelerators and incubators coming out of the university and out of out of the state of Hawaii yes and some private enterprises as well right so now I think that uh, a healthy ecosystem is starting to develop here that that maximizes the natural advantages that Hawaii has I agree would, would you agree how, how is that showing itself well so um, this is a, a glass half full, gl glass half empty kind of issue. Yeah. I mean, Hawaii is always going to suffer from critical um, needs. It's going to always have a shortage of uh, investment capital. It's always going to have a shortage of critical talent. Um, and it's always going to have a relative shortage of deal flow compared to, um, say, the Bay Area. Mm. But I don't think the Bay Area gets to be the only place on Earth that has innovation and um, you know have a capital venture industry and as you say if you look at where we've come from mm -hmm. a dozen or so years ago to where we are now it's night and day um, and I have to give a lot of credit to a number of people out there particularly my very good friend Shanoa Farnsworth mm -hmm. who is the the head of uh, Blue Startups which was mm -hmm. founded with the help of Hank Rogers mm -hmm. from the, the Tetris company yeah. um, and uh, also um, things like Accelerate UH yeah. And, and other semi-state sponsored entities. So now there are a number of nurturing organizations, um, accelerators we call them now, we used yeah. to call them incubators, right? Mentorship it, it kind of program. Provides mentorship, provides a little bit of capital. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, also I think what we've seen is a transformation in our global economy that allows places like Hawaii, thanks to information technology, the internet, yeah. e-commerce and so on, to compete more easily, uh, where location is not everything. Um, and so you take that, that combination of factors. Um, you know, we have smart, motivated people here in Hawaii. And I think, as you say, there is a kind of a, a frothy ecosystem developing yeah. where um, we are improving on those three dimensions, deal flow, critical talent, and available venture capital. And on yeah. that note, we're just about finished our program. As always, we run out of time before we run out of words. And maybe there'll be another opportunity for us to sit with uh, Rob Robinson on this topic and others. I want to thank Rob for your time today. Thank you. And for your, for your wisdom. Mm. And uh, may it continue to accumulate. Let's hope. <laughs> thank you.